I'm really glad to see you all here. I'll, I'll, I'll just suggest that we'll wait maybe two minutes since we actually we have uh, people still entering the room. Okay. I nice. can do a soft welcome by saying that I'm really happy to see both familiar faces and unfamiliar faces. I see that we have good representativity from our Nordic countries. Uh, welcome also to our dear colleagues from Canada. Uh, not the least also our Dutch colleague from having been working, Luke, with the, these uh, issues for, for a long time. I'm also glad to see that we have representativity not only from, from our own collective. Uh, I see also that Ulle, Ulle Dreyer, hi, welcome here as well. I think it's great also having representation from publisher here as well. I think that can be very useful uh, in the discussions and the dialogue, because obviously that is part of, of the challenges that we are facing with the buyouts, not being able to choose our publisher, etc. So a lot of interesting things. Uh, I think then I'll actually start off and uh, I'll give you uh, an official welcome. So welcome everyone to the Nordic Film Music Days and uh, this event on sustainable or unsustainable contracts in our musical ecosystem, focusing obviously on the area of film. And today we will be looking at a first of its kind survey with the Nordic film and media composers, showing us disturbing, but not so surprising facts on unfair contracts and coercion. Coercion, by the way, is a word we use and hear quite a lot. And maybe we should take just a, a few words trying to explain that. In our film, film music world, yeah, someone using the collective transportation. That's good. In our film music world, it can be when a production company forces you to sign off your rights, often the part we call publishing rights, but sometimes all rights through a total buyout in order for you to get the job. The company redirects the part uh, of the copyright to its own company instead of to you or the publisher of your choice that actually would do some publishing. And um, that is getting your music uh, placed in other contexts or adding a monetary value to be shared with you. Personally, I think this should all be very easy to understand, but it seems to become so complicated when describing our abstract and complex world of music and filmmaking. And it shouldn't be any different than coercive contracts in any other area. So before we start off with our guests and colleagues, let's have a look at the description of coercive contracts, not specifically for composers, but maybe for workers in general. So I have a, a text from Berkeley University, a study that they made, and I love the headline, by the way. It's called Contract Under Coercion. Should one keep an agreement with a robber? You'll see where this is going. And then continues, what are coercive contracts? And it describes them as something preventing workers and consumers, in this case, from enforcing their rights under law. Invented by corporate lawyers, these contracts are sometimes used to silence victims of harassment, discrimination, or other illegal abuse. And in this way, coercive contracts pose an existential threat to our civil rights by allowing wrongdoing companies to avoid the rule of law. And we have wrongdoing companies in our field, and that's for sure. So I think there's quite a lot to take from just from that simple explanation. And this is also why the EU, and through its copyright directive, is set to even the balance between big corporates and individual creators. And we'll get into that much more today. But I think we can all agree on the fact that forcing someone into a certain contract is bad especially when the one forcing is and has so much more power than a composer desperately in need of a job. I hope we all agree. If not, 
I hope we will all agree in two hours when we've had a look at the Nor Nordic survey and also having had a presentation by Adrian Strain and Cristina Perpina Robert Navarro from CISAC on the upcoming awareness campaign. We will also have um, a first hand discussion with producer Lea Lepke trying to create a win win together with the composers, but also looking at it from different angles. It's important for us not to get stuck with our own view of what is right and wrong. But before we do this, I would like to invite my dear film music composer colleague, Kate Havnevik, and Icelandic Collecting Society Steff CEO, Gudrun Bjarnadottir, trying to get a better overall understanding of the challenges that we will address today. So very welcome. Good to see you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I would actually... It, I would actually like just to start off in, in um, more on a higher level to see from your point of view what kind of negative effects we see or will see long term from moving from this royalty, regular royalty stream for us uh, as authors into <clears throat> these lump sum and buyout uh, practice, practices. Maybe we could start... Uh, with you, Gudrun, also because you're not only the CEO, you're also a lawyer. And from what I understand, you actually worked also in, 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 uh, in law for workers as well, in, in their rights, if I understand it right as well. So please, Gudrun, what's, uh, what would your first uh, words be on, on the issue? Um, thank you, Alphonse. Um, I have to correct that I used to work uh, as an expert in, in employment law, but not anymore. Not since I, I joined, uh, I started working for, for artists, musicians, songwriters and composers. So um, I think uh, my initial thought is that uh, I think we see a growing trend and I think if we don't do anything about it now, it might be too late. Uh, we have now uh, an optimal window, perhaps, to have an impact through the implementation of the, of the DSM directive of the European Union, which I think we must grab. I think this is the moment to be loud and to, to try to do something. Uh, so I very much welcome this uh, conference that we have here today, and I hope that you know I know that AXA, where you, uh, which you represent, Alfonso, has also been addressing this issue in numerous occasions. And I think we have to really now step up our game and 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 uh, let us be heard, because otherwise this will not, this will just continue to grow. Uh, that's that's that much is for sure. And I think for collection societies, uh, staff, and then optimal, uh, also for composers, I think th th this is a threat. This is, you know, what, what happens is that their income is no longer linked to the usage of their works. If you accept a lump sum, it can maybe look good in the beginning, but in the case that your work goes really viral, it, it goes all around the world. Uh, you will not really receive it. You will not receive anything more. This is just it. Whereas, uh, you know, in, in the, the royalty world that I live in, uh, I mean, this, this, this is income which you are going to be, which you are going to be, can be dependent upon for years and years to come. And even as a pensionary. Uh, so you slowly build up a repertoire and, and, and uh, if it's good enough, if it's, uh, you know, if it's shown, your works have been used, I mean, you will benefit for a long time. So accepting a lump sum in the beginning is highly risky for your, uh, for your, for your income and, and for your, you know, for your income and for your life in the future. So um, I think we should very much be aware of this, this practice. Thank you. Thank you, Gudrun. And Kate, you working in this field, you, as many others, know how difficult it is before you actually launch a film and after a while see if it's a success or not 
how would you even start trying to put a figure on what your music is worth? So, well, well, yeah, well, that varies from project to project, and you have to be. I mean, it's it's really good if you can if you can get to know what the total budget is, because then you can adjust yourself to that budget. So, if it's an indie film which doesn't have like a, you know a super high budget, so. Um, but if it's it's a film with a big budget, I mean, why, why should a composer uh, earn badly? You know, why shouldn't we have a, a proper salary if it's possible? So um, I'm always trying to negotiate um, uh, the best terms, of course. But I've noticed the last few years, more and more producers are not asking for publishing and publishing rights and percentages of that. And, and it doesn't seem like they understand why they shouldn't have it. They, they're not really very um, looped in on how the economy of a composer works. Um, because one thing is the, the score they get, you know, they, they very often think they own everything about it, uh, but they're actually paying you to make, to use, to make a score and then paying to use it. They're not paying to own it. Um, so it's hard I think we need some better tools to kind of explain why it's our part and why we need to keep it like this. Otherwise we can't keep taking jobs like this. Um, and also, um, yeah, just make sure that, you know, in some territories in the world, there are certain practices, uh, practices uh, and you can't just come to any other country and say, we're gonna do it like we do it there because you have to look at the country, how does it work here? So we, in the Nordic countries, we need to be very clear on how it works here. So that if there's a, a um, production from the US or from another part of the world, they actually need to adjust to, to how we work because we live and work in these countries. And uh, so I think, it's, um, I think it's very important that we stick together and have very um what can you say like clear explanations of why this is important and why we keep it like this um i think sometimes the producers are a bit sort of lazy they're trying to avoid a lot of work of you know when they license things all over the place and they're trying to sort of it's much easier if they just own everything you know and they can do whatever they want with it but um that's not really on for us. So uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's just very important that we have clear kind of uh, responses and guidelines to what we can say in those situations. Because I, I do know people who've lost jobs because uh, they didn't want to give away part of their publishing, and that really sucks. So, and I think that means that the production company just really doesn't understand how the financial or how the economy for a composer is. I mean, last year I, I had finished a film in 2019 and it had a premiere 6th of March a year ago. So it only had like one week in the cinemas. <laughs> and, you know, which was terrible for me because I was supposed to earn royalties from, from uh, the viewings, the screenings in the cinemas. So you never know, you know, if it's a successful film or, or not. And that's, that's with a lot of creative projects you you never know that's part of the business yeah i guess that's why the fairness should be sharing both risk and success and not only one part of it um, but, but i have to ask both of you um, before entering uh, the details of the survey etc do you actually see a shift in how this is handled in in the industry do you see an in increase do you see it from a collective rights management perspective a reducement of uh, of uh, the repertoire that that we are able to to administer and kate do you see it uh, as a concrete difference that this actually is becoming praxis for you and those uh, the colleagues that you know we can start with gudrun yes i I do see a shift. I Obviously, it's um, apparent from just, for instance, our agreement with Netflix, which carves out any works that they uh, 
of their own production where they have them, you know themselves uh, made contracts with the composers and do and done a buyout that obviously affects you know the the money coming in from our agreement with netflix so yes we can see that but i also want to mention a, <clears throat> another thing which is a, is a is a shift towards more and more production companies demanding a share of the publishing income of the of the composer and that i see is happening more and more often and i have to say as that i'm also very worried about that shift as those production companies they do not really know what the music publisher is they are not really prepared to take on the roles as a publisher to carry out the the function of a music publisher um, and in the in the agreements that I've seen, um, it's very vague what they will actually do as a publisher. There is, for instance, usually no no um, provisions on on payments or or statements or whatever you know what we see usually in a publishing contract. So um, I think they they are wanting a share of of the income of the of the composer without taking at the same time the responsibility that uh, a publisher uh, usually takes on, which I also think is very worrying. We, we, we might come more into that later in, in this meeting. Yeah, that, that's what I meant about like, the they don't really know what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they just think it's a way of getting more money. Uh, so, and that they should have it because they're making the film. <laughs> so it's a little bit tricky tricky that um, we have I mean I see even the even the national broadcaster who's who's you know uh, got funded by the state is now giving terrible contracts to the composers and I see in our Norwegian composer community there are more and more questions about you know what do they mean in this clause you know it's it says they can use my music for anything in any other project and you know it's very it's like they're all trying to get a little bit more out of, like squeeze the composers a little bit more, see what they can get some more money or usage or something. And I think it's important to, if we're gonna have film composers and media composers, we need proper terms to work with. So we need to express that to the, the business. Thank you, Kate. And I think that we, do have some evidence, not exactly on what's in the contracts, but we can see from other authorities and other studies having been made, the differences during the past 10 years. We have one in Sweden made by the Arts Grants Council, for example, where you see the social and economic situation of not only composers, but cultural creators, as they are called. And you clearly see that there is, uh, you know, it's a downward spiral with this. So, so at least somewhere there is something not really working well for those creating the content, while you still see that there's money out there. So that's the positive part of it. So maybe there's um, th there needs to be a balance. And it's also interesting to see that that when creators and performers are remunerated, much of that money, and we know that, goes back into the value chain, investments in instruments, investments in new culture, new music, which is good for society as well, instead of having third parties, you know, draining the system sometimes. And I'm not saying that everyone does this. This is also, it's not black and white. And of course, you need to have contracts that are fair both ways, because you also need to be able to actually create the film from, um, and, and yes, Kate. Yeah, no, it's that, that's the thing fair both ways. Like I'm doing a, a Norwegian teenage movie for Netflix now. There's a Norwegian producer and it's a great team, but I don't think they quite understand music and uh, neither the, the, the licensing of the songs or the, the score uh, composing and the licensing of that. Because the first thing they say is that they want everything to be fair. They want everyone to be happy but they're not going to give you this, you know, they're not going to play the NCB and they won't, why can't they have part of the publishing? Like, it's like, it's kind of like, um, like they're already trying to get something more 
but they're still say, saying they want to be fair. Uh, I mean, they don't they don't uh, understand very often how big the music budget should be. Uh, and then you're often the last post, so you end up with what's left or, you know, they, they don't count in all the expenses or, you know, and, and that comes to also for, for licensing songs. So I've, I've also worked as a music supervisor and they, they want to license songs for so cheap because, you know, again, they say it's great exposure, but it, it's just, they don't know the value of music. It's, it's like, it's, we need really need to put that on the agenda the value of music and the value of originally written music for their project they're paying to be able to use it not really not own it you know yes good i just wanted to continue on what you're saying kate about music supervisors because um i think that's part, may be a part of the problem within the nordics that uh, we, there was a research just last year in Iceland uh, where there were two students in, of the art university who looked at all the Icelandic films that had been uh, given a grant from public authorities for the last 10 years. And it turned out, I think only of four of those actually had a music supervisor working on the film. Of course, I do understand that Iceland is a small market and, and might not have the same budget as in the other Nordic countries, but I think the same goes to a, for a lot of independent movies making in the other Nordics. And um, I think in that respect, uh, maybe a solution to the uh, part of the problem is to have uh, producers in the Nordic realize that they need a music supervisor who is knows about clearing songs, knows about the licensing, can work with both the score composers and, and license, you know, um, previously released music. And um, I think that that would maybe help. Yes. And it's like I've, I've come to, I've had this issue a few times with films I'm doing, I'm scoring a film, and then they suddenly want to use one of my, my previously released songs from an album that I've written with some other people, released some years ago, I'm singing on it as an artist. And then they think that's for free because they have me as a score composer. And I try to explain to them that I don't intend to charge a lot for it, but there are other people who are involved. There are other writers, there are producers, you know, like the, it's, not, it's not really um, my, my say even. To, to give anything for free, because I, I don't think things should be given for free anyway. And I think, yeah, it's a big uh, responsibility for us composers to actually say no and, uh, and, uh, and try to claim what we, what we are entitled to have. Uh, but but I, do, I do know that the pra praxis is in like the States, I mean, it's coming over here and they're not really aware of how things work over here. So we need to almost make a, we need to make like a thing, film composers, uh, financial situation for dummies, <laughs> you know, like a little sort of book of, of how to, yeah, wh why things should be this way. And, you know, I, I also want everything to be fair. I also want uh, the producers to, to have what they're entitled to, but I just, don't want to constantly feel ripped off. <laughs> you know? no, you're absolutely right, Kate. And, and I have to say that, that there's something in this that hopefully, as you said, Gudrun, will be facilitated by the new modernized copyright. Because what you say also as just saying that you're a publisher or just claiming the publishing rights without really knowing what publishing is, that is something, and I see this also in the chat, Eric, that, that that is something that will be easier for us when we have the transparency clause, when we have something saying that you actually have to be transparent and you have to show what you are doing in order to actually create value with the music that you have obtained rights to. And if not, give them back. Or, I mean, th this is uh, basically what we're now trying to make sure is not watered down in the national implementations of the copyright directive. And I think 
that is the most important part because you can never trust that you go into a discussion and just try if if we're just nice maybe we'll come to a conclusion that will be and a result that is good for both parties. Unfortunately, that is not always the case. Kate? Yeah, I'm, I totally agree with you. It's, um, I've experienced it's not uh, getting you anywhere being too nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, what I wanted to say is that, um, uh, oh, it just slipped my mind. <laughs> Sorry, what was it? Um, I was well, we can get well, well, you're thinking, I, I'm, I also uh, picked up one thing you said, doing everything for free, Kate, that usually includes you You also making the cue sheets. Yeah, that's, that's right. And <laughs> which is a job in itself, which you should not, you know, op- automatically be, be asked to do. Yeah, no, what I was going to say is that if you ever are in a position where you have to give something away, you know, then make sure it's only for a limited time, you know? It's only for like three years, five years, and then everything falls back to you if you have to, if there's, if it's impossible or, you know, or if it's reasonable for some reason, you know, in that situation for, for, for that project. Make sure you always have a clause that it's only for a certain amount of years, and then it goes back to you. And also maybe, maybe even if you're, pay isn't enough that after a certain amount of, of screenings or, or uh, streams, it can trigger another payment for you. You know, try to, you know, you can be accommodating like that in making the contract suit all parts the best way possible. But- uh, That's very good. Yeah. Uh, I think we, we, we will move on now. Uh, and uh, just to answer one of the questions that I see there from Niklas Schmidt, if any of the national EU national parliaments implemented the directive, uh, as for now, it's only from what I understand the Dutch that has done that, it's implemented. But from what I hear from my colleagues there, and Luke, uh, Luke Dicker, you're here today. If, if I'm wrong, you just uh, raise your voice, as I know you can. Um, and um, from what I understand, this is it, we haven't seen any effects of it yet, obviously. So it's implemented. But whether or not it's been done in, in a better or worse uh, way than other countries in, later, that is something that we will need to see. And we need to collaborate on this implementation process now until the end, looking at whatever works best for us. And we shouldn't be naive. Our counterparts will make their voices heard during these uh, last months. They already do. Some of the platforms, for example, they kind of like and want the their repertoire to have some problems with filters, et cetera, in order to show that things uh, really don't work when you have to deal with copyright um, material. We're we're going to move on. Thank you so much, Kate and Gudrun, for helping us uh, out in in entering this uh, evening. And we will get back to uh, Gudrun also. You will help us uh, with moderating some of the questions. Please feel free to add on to to questions uh, in the chat. And now we'll move on uh, and welcome, we'll say welcome to Adrian Strain and Cristina Perpigna Robert Navarro from CISAC. And uh, very good to have you here. Hi. Uh, we will today get an insight on, on the upcoming awareness campaign and where that fits in the discussions of, of what we're talking about today. And hopefully we'll, we'll get more knowledgeable and also some inspiration for our future discussions and the work we are doing together, of course, with CZAC. So very welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, And I hope we will definitely also get very inspired by um, your invitation. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, I'm Adrian Strain. I'm the Director of Communications for CZAC. Uh, and uh, I'm going to do this uh, jointly with Christina, my colleague, who is our director of uh, legal and policy. As I say, it's great to be here. Thank you very much indeed to Lona for inviting me, for Alphonse for your kind introduction. Um, it's a really important opportunity for us to be here at Nordic Music Film Days to tell you um, briefly about Your Music, Your Future, our um, education uh, campaign on royalties and copyright buyouts. Uh, I have got uh, a few slides just to uh, illustrate um, the um, uh, 
to illustrate this, and I'm just going to find it now. Um, if I, uh, just, um, can you see this? Can you see this? Is that okay? Good. Um, I'm just going to very briefly, uh, for those of you who just would like a reminder as to what CZAC is. So, of course, we are the uh, International Confederation of Author Societies, and our uh, representation is of uh, we have we have members in uh, over 120 countries, and we represent 230 or plus. Uh, author societies globally. And our mission is to be a voice to policymakers, but uh, also a business support to author societies and a global information authority. Um, uh, th and the, for, the, for some context of our, um, uh, for the copyright uh, uh, buyout campaign, over the years, we have uh, produced a, lo a lot of pu publications and studies which reflect uh, the kind of broad scope of what CZAC, of CZAC's work, which of course encompasses not just music, but five repertoires uh, or, or, or as well. And uh, they, they range from uh, uh, lobbying reports on, uh, 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 in order to, uh, against copyright safe harbors, to uh, education work, and to uh, particular country studies on particular markets such as, uh, as China. Um, one of our, main reports that we produce each year, and it's a good gateway into the issue of copyright uh, buyouts, is our global collections report. And that uh, was produced at the end of last year, and it had one very uh, eye-catching uh, table, which really sums up the state of the collections uh, sector today. And this is the table which shows, uh, after many years of uh, growth, of absolute um, pre precipitous fall in collections in 2020, as they are expected. At the time of publication, it was expected that they would fall globally. Collection royalty collections through creators by up to 35%. That's more than 3 billion uh, euros. And uh, it's in that context that this issue has become much more important and more pressing uh, in the last year because of the impact of COVID and I'm now gonna move on to another slide, which we also ran, which shows uh, that the COVID of course has focused attention on away from the revenue streams, which have collapsed live and, and public performance, for example, and to those ones where uh, there is a fast growing, those ones that are fast growing. And the particular one, of course, is subscription video streaming. And you see here, we work with a research consultancy called uh, Future Source, and they, you see the, the sharp rise in the subscription, the orange box is 60, 40, from 41 to 67 billion euros just in the, uh, in the last two years. And that is the market, which is so much where the arena where we are talking about uh, copyright buyouts. And you'll just see that that of the different audiovisual uh, audiovisual channels, that's the one that is growing big time. And that has really focused this issue on the fact that a, a sector, a technology sector of platforms is thriving out of the, in, during the time of the pandemic, at the same time while a community, a global community of, cre of creators is suffering hugely. And it raises this question of, uh, is this sector doing so well, sharing the revenues fairly? Um, I'm going to hand over now to Christina, who is going to give a few um, points of legal context because our work is divided into two areas here. One is um, on providing uh, legal information and um, on the legal environment, and the other is educational. And I'm gonna come back onto the educational in a second. So I'm handing over to you, Christina. Yep. Thank you, Adrian. I'll, I'm going to ask you to move my three slides. I have just three slides, yep. but um, okay, great. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Lona, and also Alphonse for, for inviting us here. I think this is the second time that both Adrian and I have been in, in, in this initiative from the Nordic Composer um, Film Music Forum. And I, and I think it's great because it shows, I think that at least what CSAC is doing here, that we are trying to actually try to provide support and knowledge and information and 
options to composers so that at least um, when, song, when composers and creators and songwriters, when they face um, these, these provisions, the, these buyout clauses and provisions, at least that they know what the risks are, what the consequences are, and that they have different options. So um, I'm just going to explain what um, CSAC has done from the legal perspective from our global policy um, campaign. And, and then and just to lead into the, um, the buyout guidelines, which have been published in June this year. Um, so just um, initially what we've tried to do is just try to see what is the picture of the situation. So what is the legal situation around the world? Obviously it is impossible to analyze, to provide a full um, detailed examination of all the various legal regimes around the world regarding um, copyright and how cotton buyouts can be implemented. But what we did is we, um, we commissioned a few, uh, three separate legal studies. Um, one which is more focused on Europe, another one which is focused on the Asia Pacific regime, and a third one in Latin America. To, to try to at least understand why this phenomenon was starting to, 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 to contaminate, I'm going to say it, or to extend in many, many different countries around the world. So um, here I'm going to talk a little bit more about the European study, which we did, because obviously it's more, it has a, a greater importance for, for, this, um, for this public. Um, so what we, we saw in, a, in especially focusing in Europe and on VOD streaming services is that in fact, in Europe, there are many countries which have very strong um, legal copyright provisions, which do protect creators against buyouts or which at least make buyout provisions more difficult to enforce. And also if you combine that with the fact that in many European countries, you have an exclusive assignment of performing rights to um, national CMOs. You know, it was a surprise to see why these uh, creators and composers and songwriters in Europe were being forced to, to sign these buyout clauses. So um, what one of our studies did is try to explain how um, SVOD services like Netflix or Disney or other um, streaming services were actually circumventing these we would say like very strong legal provisions and this exclusivity um, by actually applying the choice of law provisions whereby even if the contract was purely European, so you would have, for example, a Spanish um, production company uh, with, a, with a French composer, for example. In fact, what was happening is that in these types of contracts, they were applying or making these contracts subject to US law or to US or common law regimes, which allow for these works made for higher systems, which do allow for these types of, um, of buyout provisions. And also for, because I'm going to go very quickly because I, I, I know we have very little time, but the idea was also what was very clear is that even if creators or composers and songwriters do, um, um, have very strong legal provisions or regimes in their countries. In, in, in practice, they would just simply sign the buyouts because they would fear losing their jobs. They fear being blacklisted. So even if they do have a very strong protective regime, they just simply would sign the, the, the buyouts in order to, to avoid being blacklisted. So, um, so that it, it, in this context, what we did is, um, apart from these legal studies, taking into account the experience, the, the information we got from these legal studies and the contribution we got from the members of the CSAC Global Policy Committee, which um, represents societies from, from all over the world, we published the CSAC guideline, guidelines in order to address the buyout issue in June this year. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the um, basic issues which are highlighted in these, um, in these guidelines. So um, first of all, what we did is we, first of all, we tried to, um, to adopt a more practical approach. Um, there's a lot of legal 
explanations, legal um, questions, legal complexities, which can be analyzed. But by publishing the guidelines, we try to um, focus on a very practical perspective to see how we could provide um, some options, alternative suggestions to uh, societies, to CMOs, and to creators when they face these buyout um, provisions. Um, some of the basic, I would say, conclusions from or, or first analysis from the guidelines was, and I think this has been mentioned before, is that we see that the buyout problem is extending globally. It's everywhere. So it's not just a European issue. It's um, it affects all the countries in the world and it affects all types of exploitation. So even though within Europe, we focused more on the typical Netflix, Disney, SVOD platform, we saw that in from other, from the experience and the information we got from the other um, legal studies, that it was affecting various types of exploitation. So we're talking about broadcasting, um, advertising, video games, all types of back-end royalties, which are being affected by um, buyout clauses. And this, in many cases, um, means that it's just not only the relationship between the creator, the composer, and the audiovisual producer, but also the fact that many users or major users are using um, these buyout provisions, these buyout clauses, in order to reduce, significantly reduce the tariffs of collecting societies, um, specifically within Europe. Also, guy, from we, what we saw from this experience is that it's not only affecting composers, it's also affecting other um, audiovisual authors like um, composers, I like, sorry, like um, directors and screenwriters. So um, based on the experience we got from this, what we decided is, in these guidelines to do, give some basic um, recommendations. I'm obviously, I don't have time in this, um, in these very short time, which I have right now to get into detail on this. I'm you know, happy to answer questions, but yeah, basically what we did is to see what type of, or, or how this, could, this problem could be approached both within Europe in lobbying recommendations and outside of Europe. Um, I've seen this as mentioned before, um, both um, Alphonse has mentioned that we have a very good window of opportunity right now. I think Gudrun also mentioned this within Europe with the copyright directive implementation, which is taking um, place right now in Europe. It is a very important moment to make sure that Article 18 of the copyright directive is correctly implemented. Um, most of you know Article 18 um, introduces the principle of proportional remuneration. So uh, and in all cases where there is an assignment of rights, there, the rule is that there has to be a proportional remuneration, which means that the authors need to live of the success of their works and not to live from lump sums, which is the principle of, of buyouts. That of course is the principle, but it's true that the directive does allow for exceptions, but these need to be very, very limited exceptions. So that's, I think, the most important thing in the copyright directive to make sure that Article 18 is correctly implemented. And then there's a series of other provisions in the copyright directive, which help, I would say, discourage US platforms from introducing these um, sort of, uh, these buyout provisions, like um, obviously the bestseller clauses, which um, allow from, for a mechanism to adjust the contract um, remuneration in case there has been a lump sum payment. And also additional um, provisions like provisions which ensure that there's clear transparency reporting obligations, that there's a right of revocation in case that there's a, um, um, a lack of exploitation of a work. So there's, there's a, a certain number of provisions, what we call the transparency triangle in the um, copyright directive, which now is specifically the correct moment to ensure that this is correctly implemented um, in the uh, European member states. Other issues which are uh, also important and which can be also used to try to um, 
to to raise arguments against pi, uh, against buyouts. And I think it's been mentioned also before by Alphonse when he mentioned these coercive contracts. What we've analyzed is that it's important to try to look at other types of law like um, um, like um, uh, regulations which protect consumers or which protect uh, in labor law employees to ensure that you apply these principles that may restrict this contractual freedom in order to compensate these weaker parties in their bargaining position. So some way to try to um, compare co creators to the position which employees or consumers have when they face very, very strong um, negotiating positions from very strong users like um, major platforms. Um, also, uh, there are additional options which are um, suggestions which are included in the guidelines. These are used from um, experiences from other countries in the world. So for example, in Brazil, there's a time limit when you do assign your lights exclusively to, um, to a specific user. So in Brazil, there's a maximum 10 years for any type of assignment of rights. And then I would say like the, the, the last two ideas, which I would like to stress is that it is, um, it is obvious that creators are very much, um, I would say, um, worried or, or um, they fear the potential retaliation they can get from the major users in case they don't um, uh, you know, agree with these buyout provisions. And in these cases, I think it's important to try to look at the benefits of, uh, of collective management, because with the principle of the strengthening numbers, usually you can, you're able to protect individual creators by using the CMO as a sort of shield to protect the creator against um, these bad practices or these very major, um, these big users, which, um, which can, which by collective management, you can try to balance the negotiation. And, and finally, and here I'll, I'll uh, again hand over to Adrian, what we did see is that it was absolutely essential to have these raising awareness measures. So it was very much encouraged to have societies encourage these types of awareness raising campaigns to teach, to educate, or just to inform composers and creators about the industry risk they face when they have when, they, when they're faced with these um, buyout uh, provisions or practices. And in this, um, in this context is where this Your Music, Your Future campaign um, is one of the major, major issues which CSAC is, is trying to, to put a lot of weight in. Um, Adrian? Okay. Yep. Well, I'll be very brief, um, but uh, it's very well timed that we're talking to you um, because uh, this, later this week, We'll be uh, launching a, a website called Your Music, Your Future, <laughs> Your Music, Your Future International, uh, and the idea is here is a uh, uh, is that we have linked up with a uh, a movement in the U.S. Uh, a very successful uh, campaign called Your Music, Your Future, and they um, have a developed uh, community, uh, and their mission the mission of the uh, uh, the mission of our site is a, an international edu campaign that helps to that aims to help creators everywhere understand their options when it comes to royalties and copyright buyouts. Um, it, it's the, the emphasis of, is upon education, not lobbying. It's the education, the, the emphasis is on uh, recognizing that uh, creators make their own business decisions and uh, what CSAC can add, add how, how it can add value uh, is to uh, provide the best kind of information uh, that will help them make those decisions. Uh, the, the, the key points about the campaign are that it's a it's it's it, it is by being linked up with your music your future it's a it has a it is creator led and that means that it wants to be something which is not run by CZAC, but CZAC is more the sort of the backroom power as it were the engine but really this is one where we would like to be working very much alongside not in competition but alongside uh, the creator organizations right across so that's why it's very very interesting i feel as if we are very much in exactly the same world uh, as um, all the other creator organizations. And I'd, I'm very interested in, we, 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 when we launch this on, on Thursday, it, it is with support, for example, of CM, of the IVAs in the, in, in the UK, 
uh, and and uh, we'll be very happy. The, uh, the the IMPF representing the school publishers, and we'll be very very keen to work alongside uh, Exeter and to draw on your expertise and your you know, your your information. Uh, it's a uh, so the 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 site will uh, can largely. I mean, when talking about the content of it, um, it answers fairly simple. It's, it's not it's not written in a legal way. It's written very much aimed at the maybe the young creator who for whom the royalties are going to be this the way of sustaining a future career. So it's about how buyouts affect you, royalty versus buyouts, understanding buyouts clauses. And look at the where CZAC can add some value, looking at the legal different le legal regimes in different parts of the world and how they interplay. So um, I'm just these are just little shots of the site. I say we are rolling this out on Thursday, and this is so well timed because we we it, it is unfinished work. It's it's good enough to go live, but it's certainly uh, this is only the start rather than the finish. And so we would look forward to populating it with content. We need case studies, and we would like to have to this to be something that starts to be a sort of knowledge hub, which people can sign up to and contribute content and case studies and their voices to. Uh, so um, I would just finally sort of end by saying, I think this does meet a need, which uh, for what is recognized being, has been a very fast growing issue. Um, it's a first step in the process, it's not the end. It's about education essentially, rather than advocacy or trying to influence any business decisions. And the key point about it, I think that CZAC brings to the party is that it's global because clearly what's happening is that what is concerning creators in Scandinavia uh, is also uh -huh. in, in Asia and Latin America. And that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, Christina. That's not me talking. That's someone not muting their microphone, just to, for everyone to know. So, so thank you very much. I think this is um, this is uh, of in, you know it gives you inspiration when you see that that we have this kind of collaboration. And I have to see that one of the most important things has been not seeing each other as competition, and when when we had this campaign coming, not from, from you then, but, but, but in the States with your music, your future, that was when that really hit off was uh, in the fight against discovery, obviously, and the deal that, that they threatened us with. But we all stood by them then. EXA, SIAM, our American, Canadian colleagues, everyone. And it was once again, when we are all unified behind something, a, a message like that, that's when it becomes strong. And I would like to say one thing to our colleagues, especially here, I, and I, I have said it before, but it's worth saying again, because it shows that we can really make a difference. When we talk about the transparency triangle, that was not uh, on the table before we, as EXA, took evidence from 12 countries, and we have Luke Dicker here today from, from Holland as well, uh, where we took that evidence to the commission and showed them something that was outrageous. We had it on tape, uh, TV stations saying that if you don't sign off your rights, you will never ever work for any of our channels ever again in your life. So it was really from that that, that the, these articles came about as well, and all of us helping uh, both on the global but also European uh, stage so, so it, it can make a difference when we actually take uh, the initiative so thank you very much for this initiative and and rest assured that we'll all be behind it as well and uh, i i hope you will also guide us a, a, a bit in how best to get this uh, communicated in with our uh, colleagues around uh, Europe, but also globally, of course it is. So let's open up for a few questions. Gudrun, do we have um, any questions that, that you would like to moderate and, and put forward? Yes, well, we had a question on uh, um, how does CSAC encourage the CMOs to protect creators? And are there any documents explaining this on the CSAC website? It's a, was a, um, but I, I, I perhaps, uh, 
this question has already been answered. This is going to be a launch now in 18th of February with documents, but perhaps you can though add to this. How, how can CSEC encourage CMO to, CMOs to protect creators? Um, well, I, I, I suppose CSEC um, is the, um, the, the hub of a very, very diverse uh, world. So our members are in all sorts of different positions and have different needs. And I suppose talking specifically about this education campaign, no, no, not one of our societies is, is in the same position. So some we will expect some of them to feel um, encouraged and to, to, to use this site and others will will feel maybe for whatever reason they're less, 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 less needing of it. Maybe they have solutions at, at local level. I mean, what is CSAC is trying to do with this site is to meet a clear need that has been asked for by our societies. Um, and as I say, re very much recognizing that it's a global, a global issue. Um, and so we, we, I can certainly take any questions upon any specific um, documents and specific initiatives that we're providing in, to our members, which we're doing on a very regular basis right ac across the board. Um, there was also a, a question, not directly to CSAC, but in general on, on the terms of, of streaming services, etc. Why are those terms not made public? And I think I kind of answered it myself on the chat that, and saying that uh, in all those agreements that at least the CMOs do with Netflix or other streaming services, there is always a confidentiality clause, which prevents us from actually uh, re re revealing those provisions on, on terms, etc. Which of course is bad, but uh, at least a small society such as Steph in Iceland cannot do much about it. Perhaps if, if you know, the CMOs could come more together and, and make a push and try to demand more transparency in this regard, something would change. But unless that happens, uh, not, not much will change in that respect, I think. Is, does anyone else like to comment on that? Could we ask maybe Christina if you would like to just elaborate on the fact that also in the directive, we, we do have provisions saying that basically, and I'm not a lawyer, so I would say you cannot hide behind an NDA. So you cannot do the wrongful uh, actions just because you have an NDA. Is that something you could just elaborate shortly on? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a specific um, article in the, in the provision which refers to the fact that authors and composers, they, have, they are entitled to receive um, on a regular basis, uh, at least once a year, all of relevant um, comprehensive information regarding the exploitation of the works which, um, which they have assigned to their assignees. Um, again, this is a principle, it's, it's a reporting obligation. Um, th this, one of the, the, the specific, um, I would say key issues of the directive is that um, there is another provision which specifies that the, these, what Alphonse has mentioned as the transparency triangle, these are, they can, these articles cannot be, I would say, um, um, waived through contractual provisions. So these are mandatory um, obligations, which have to be implemented in national um, copyright laws, with the exception of the proportional remuneration in Article 18. So it's very surprising that the transparency triangle, the bestseller clause, the, um, the right of revocation, which are all rights for authors and for performers, those are mandatory. So if correctly implemented, it would not be possible to circumvent these provisions through a contractual um, provision as is happening right now with the bestseller, uh, with, the, with the buyout clauses. The only exception in the copyright directive is, in fact, the proportional remuneration principle, which is Article 18. We don't know why that was the exception, but that does not prevent member states from also making that mandatory. So if member states, when they do implement the copyright directive, they say that the proportional remuneration, which is the principle against buyouts, is mandatory, then even if you have, for example, a contract with a US producer, which does um, circumvent US 
European law by making it subject to US law, it would not be po possible to um, circumvent that proportional remuneration provision, which you know, makes it um, obligatory for the, use, for the author to receive a, a, a percentage of what is the success or the income of that work. But that requires correct lobbying in the implementation. So I believe, for example, the French um, decree or the ordinance has already like extended that mandatory provision to the um, proportional remuneration. But that's something which needs to be lobbied by obviously by, by CMOs when they're um, lobbying and making their submissions for their national implementation. But again, as, as we've mentioned in the beginning, CSAC has been working on this because of this enormous concern we got from our um, society members, which they were the ones who approached CSAC to say, what can we do to protect our members, our composers against these buyout provisions? So we know that CMOs and authors' rights societies are very much interested in this right now because of the copyright directive implementation. But of course, this is something which is only an answer within Europe. In other, in other countries outside of Europe, we have to find other solutions because they don't have this window of opportunity with the copyright directive. Thank you, Christina. But I also have to say that we do influence each other on a global scale. So it's yes. important showing also what uh, the good effects are of this, because we also have to say that the EU, when, when taking this decision, of course, it's because they like us, but it's definitely not because only because they like us. It's because this is also an important industry. The creative industry is, is something that, that they wanted to promote in competition with others. And if others see that it's actually good to make it sustainable for those creating the content in the creative industries, of course, that would be a good deal for everyone. So thank you very much. And I see we, we have a few comments uh, also on the side. Ed Henderson from Canada, you, you, you are absolutely right. You also show that there are even worse you know, examples when you do not only call yourself a publisher, but you put yourself up as author, even though you haven't created anything. And this, uh, this is something that we have seen before and we see it um, uh, more and more. So I think this is also a very important thing to put you know, the, the, the light on and uh, making sure that a creator is actually the one creating the content and not just being able to put themselves up as author. Um, very good. So I think that actually we're, um, we're, um, it's about time to move on to I was going to say the most important part, but since this is a short break that we're going to take, that's probably not the most important part. So uh, once again, thank you, Christina. Thank you, Adrian. Very nice to have you here. And, and we will continue our co collaboration and uh, hopefully uh, even closer in, in the future. So we're looking forward to that. So thank you very much. And I suggest that we take a five-minute break uh, now, and then we will present uh, the Nordic survey that we have uh, uh, made some, uh, we've sent out some information about it and uh, I think you will find it very interesting. So see you, you here back in five minutes and um, we'll take it from there. Thank you. So welcome back. Five minute break is over and uh, I don't see you now. So I, I really don't know if you're all if most of you are back, but I guess you didn't go very far. Uh, so uh, if you uh, hear me now, I, I hope that you'll get back to your desks and uh, ready for the results of the Nordic survey. Great, so uh, let's, uh, let's start. So the Nordic Film Music Days, through its um, author organization or, or organizations, carried out a survey this January. You saw some of the material already in the press release, and you did see some disturbing figures. And add to that some comments that has been sent to us in the survey. We do see that there are pretty tough comments saying that 
they don't see any other alternative than to leave their professional uh, occupation as film music composers due to the lack of fair remuneration and increasing right grabs. So this is serious, and we all know this. So we have to take it seriously, but we also need to look at how to create more sustainable models. And this in collaboration with uh, those having the power to influence. This can be in Europe, like uh, the EU Commission and uh, looking at um, some of the projects that they have as um, Music Moves Europe, where you're now uh, launching uh, new ideas to look at more sustainable models. So why did we do this survey? Well, I think we heard enough already today. Uh, and the background was really that we in the Nordic market saw the norms in the Nordic market rapidly changing. And traditionally, Nordic authors and creators have been profiting from their author's rights through a lifelong career with regular payments. Um, that doesn't mean that you become a millionaire, but it makes it sustainable. But we also see now that um, we're presented much more with uh, buyout clauses, surrendering full control of their work, and also uh, your moral rights, which is something we'll get back to in the survey and something at least the UN says is not possible to negotiate because the moral rights, according to them, is a human right. So to what extent does all of this happen? That is exactly what we wanted to know. And let's look at the next slide. So first of all, you can see the nationality. And uh, we have almost the same numbers of participation from Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish composers, whereas the Finnish and Icelandic composers were a bit fewer in numbers. And before we move on, I have to say, you, you'll have to excuse some of the slides will have, it's, it doesn't really, the text doesn't give you a, a very good uh, picture. You will be able to have uh, this uh, accessible where you can read it in detail. Uh, some of it uh, is, is, is a bit difficult to, to decipher in the slide, but I will read for you so you will uh, get a clear picture out of it. So next slide, please. So here, we ask the composers of their musical background. And as you see that there are several answers, and I have to say already now that if some of you count the percentages in some of the slides to over 100%, it's not because we do not know uh, how to count. It's actually because uh, the participants were able to give uh, multiple answers. So that's why. But what we could see here mainly is that 38% of the participating uh, composers are educated as composers. 38 uh, state that they're educated as musicians. And 43% say that they are self-educated. Next slide, please. So the next question was put like this. Working as a composer in the audiovisual field also requires knowledge about how to run a business. With what background are you running your business? We could see that 1% of the composers has, well, a proper education in law or business, which is, of course, uh, strange to say what a proper education in law is when it comes to authors' rights and copyright. We've all met lawyers that um, are specialized in certain fields of music and copyright, and not all actually that up to date, because this is both very complex and changing. We have 9% having attended shorter courses in law or business, 30% of the composers are working closely together with someone with those skills. 81% say that they are running their businesses with the knowledge that they have picked up on the way. And once again, this is a bit more than 100%, but I gave you the answer on, on why uh, 
recently. So let's move on. Here you can see from those uh, having answered the survey that 8% have five years, uh, less than five years experience. 19% have been working in the field between five and 10 years. And 73% of the composers have been in the game for more than 10 years. Next slide. So what countries are you mainly working in? was the next question. And 36% of the composers are working all over, in their own countries, in other Nordic countries, European countries, and internationally. 53 of the composers are only working in their own country. Next slide. We moved on asking, have you within the last two years, that is 19 and 20, been asked buy a production company for a license to use your music out of context, that is in prequels, sequels, spin-offs, remakes, and any ancillary rights, games, uh, merchandise, etc. 6% answer yes, usually, to that question. 31% of the composers are sometimes being asked that question. 16 composers are only exceptionally being asked that question. 42% of the composers have never been asked the question. And from the six composers that usually are asked from a production company to license their music, all of them are self-educated when it comes to the knowledge within law and business. Next slide. We moved on asking, in your view, do you think that within the last two years you have been offered a fair compensation for the use of your work? 14% said no, never. 18% answered no, only exceptionally. And 21% said yes, sometimes. 16 composers asked, answered uh, yes, usually this happens. I'm not giving you all the details on, um, we split this up also in countries uh, in the questions, but this can made, be made um, available to you later as well. It's interesting. Slide nine, please. So here we uh, asked, have you within the two last years been asked by a production company to transfer a part of the copyright in order for the production company to become or act as a music publisher. That is, obtain and represent the intellectual and, and uh, moral uh, rights of the work. 39% said no, never. 7% only exceptionally. 39% yes, sometimes. And 9% yes, this usually happens. Next slide. So if you have been asked to give up your publishing rights, how big a share of that income are the production companies mostly asking you for? 14% have been asked for less than 25% of their publishing rights. 16% for more than 50%. And here we can say that it is quite different also in the different countries. We, uh, we see, for example, that uh, uh, we actually none from Iceland were, was asked for more than 50%. I don't know, Gudrun, if that is actually because you are successful in, in uh, the information and education. In this It's very important anyway. And uh, four of the nine composers are that has been asked for more than 50% are working closely together with someone who knows about the form of business, uh, so to say. So with that, you could actually say that those working closely with those with knowledge in publish in business and, uh, and law uh, did not get much help here. Uh, so next slide. In your view, do you think that within the last two years you've been offered a fair compensation 
for the transfer of your publishing rights. So not only if they actually had to give them up, did you get a fair remuneration or, or pay for it? 47% think that they have not been offered a fair share. And that's basically half of the composers, that is. 15% uh, think they have been offered a fair share. Seven of the 14 composers doing that are either working together with someone with business skills or have taken shorter courses in law and business. So it might help to try to learn something about uh, business and law here. Slide 12, please. Here we asked, have you within the last two years lost a job due to turning down an offer of a specific music publisher in a production? That is, when we say music publisher, for someone wanting your publishing rights. 27% of our composers have answered yes to that question. Mostly actually from Sweden, we see here. So here, uh, that is not um, really an upside of being uh, Swedish when it comes to this, obviously. Interesting. Slide 13. Have you, within the last two years, been asked by a production company to transfer the ownership of the master rights to the production company? And 55% of the composers say yes to that. Next slide. In your view, do you think that within the last two years, you've been offered a fair compensation for that use of your work? 40% say no never or no just exceptionally so not very positive next slide and this is interesting so have you within the last two years been asked by a production company to waive your trois moral moral rights and i have to say once again this would, was made quite uh, clear when we as EXA entered as experts. I was uh, chosen as expert by the UN and the Human Rights Council in the first study ever on artistic rights. And there they said very clearly that moral rights are not really up for negotiation. They're yours and you cannot sign them off. So then it's very interesting to see that 25 3% of our composers have experienced that on once or several occasions. So let's start summing in this up. Uh, next slide, please. What you can see is that one third of the composers are being asked to give away the licenses for their music without fair compensation. We can see that half of the composers have been asked to transfer a part of the copyright in order for the production company to become a music publisher. And the composers don't think the offered compensation is fair. Almost one third of our composers have lost a job when they've turned down an offer from a production company to act as the publisher. And more than half of our composers have also been asked to transfer their master rights and they don't think it's being fairly compensated. And one fourth of our composers have been asked to waive their droit moral, their moral rights. And the last slide. Next slide, please. So the ideas for solutions for the composers, we've heard some today. Education is very important, but not just education for us, but for the whole value chain. And in order to do that, we need to work together with the other stakeholders and showing that that has a benefit for all. Maybe not for those really just in it to make some quick money uh, and not really adding to the ecosystem, but I think that most really want to do that, but maybe are not really aware of the effects uh, of their uh, actions. Sometimes you ask for more rights than you need because you're worried what would actually happen if you did not do that, if you end up in something where the film or the production or the product product is, uh, 
is limited by uh, by not having uh, enough rights. Uh, so this is something where we can show quite clearly what they need. So it is about knowledge, awareness, and um, I think this is a very good uh, a very good opportunity for us to start off uh, looking at all of this, and uh, we will take this further. Uh, I have. Uh, some more information that that will um, will I think we'll be able to send also that um, with um, uh, when making this available. And once again, I think we should highlight the fact that we do in in Europe at least have the copyright directive. And for the Nordic countries, I would just urge you all to make sure that you are actively involved through your organizations, not only your CMOs, but more so the author organizations, because those are the ones I think that the policymakers listen more to actually uh, when it comes from you uh, and not uh, just from, from representatives as well. Everyone is needed in the, in the process, obviously, but you need to raise your own voices. Good. I think we'll... Um, uh, Maybe if we have a few questions uh, here, we do actually, we are soon going to talk to um, Leah, Leah Lepker, that is, and she's a producer, and we're going to get uh, a view from, from her, uh, and also seeing what, when we talk about balanced contracts, it has to be balanced where it actually gives a value to all. So maybe we'll actually, I, uh, let's start with, with Leah and we'll uh, have some questions uh, uh, at the end. And we'll make sure that, that you will have time to ask questions because I'm sure that you uh, have a lot of input here. So maybe we, I could just uh, invite Leah here. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Hi, thank you. And thank you for joining us. I, I know, I, I think you're actually out somewhere you're not in your office right now you're oh no, uh, no i'm on vacation with my kids in a summer house so, so thank so. you for for taking the time even on your vacation it's, yeah, it's very much uh, appreciated so i would like to start off first of all maybe you can say a few words on on who you are um and, and because i i know that you have quite an extensive yes experience from from different uh, companies working as producer it's yeah. just good so I'm I'm educated at the Danish Film School, uh, where I graduated in 2007, and then I've been working uh, in various feature film companies: uh, Nimbus Film, Cosmo Film, SF Film, and lately um, in Creative Alliance. And I've done mainly feature films, but uh, past the past, I would say, three four years, has been uh, focusing on TV series. Um, um, so, 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 yeah, yes, um, we, we feel the, the same, uh, as producers, we feel the same, uh, wild west, uh, situation that, that you as composers, um, and, and as producers, we are looking for, for solutions to the demands of, of the customers that we meet. Um, and I think that dialogue is, is of great importance and I therefore I'm really happy to be invited today and we're very happy to have you here because as you say I think this can only uh, come out of a dialogue mm -hmm. and I think we're also we're planning also having uh, more of these kind of round tables together where we actually can sit down and work out something that that will be uh, functional for for everyone and as you know, of course, it's not only about making things easy and cheap. It's about maintaining quality in all parts of uh, production, because that's also the only way of actually getting some money in the end. Uh, yeah. No one really loves a bad film. Uh, no. So what, what are your take from what you've he heard here today, first of well, all? Well, my take is that, that I think one of the main problems for composers is that the people, me, my, myself included, who are making the budgets, uh, producers and line producers, actually know very little of uh, what a composer does. How, lo how long, how much time does it take to make this product that I need for my production? 
uh, how should I make it? Should it be digital? Should it be uh, live recordings? Uh, we don't. We know very little about this at the time where we make the budget. Um, whereas, as as a producer, I know more about the the work of a DOP or an editor because I've spent time with them. I've been on the set. Uh, I've been. I've. I've even. I even went to film school with them. But for a composer, I. 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 I know very little. What. What does it take? How expensive is the equipment that they need to make the sound that I that I would love? Um, how much How much time does it take? And and that's a huge problem when I when I need to set the budget to find out how much does it cost. Um, so what you're saying basically, and this is something that I know that myself and and other film music composers really uh, appreciate that is being early in yeah. the process yeah. so when that is possible so what you're saying basically is that when we sign the contract even we do not really know what the musical setup will be and also the costs because that hasn't really been decided often no. many many times and I know all creative says the production designers say, you know, I need to be in early. So everybody wants this and we want to have people in as early as possible. Um, so it's, I mean, you're not the only ones is, is my point. No. no. Um, but my point is that, that many of us, we know very little about the, the work, the actual labor that you do. How many hours do you spend um, in order to set a, a fair price? Well, it's and easy, Leah. I can tell you, we spent <laughs> thousands of hours. So that, there's there's the answer. No, no, and it's also the same for a production designer. How how long time does it take to come up with a good idea with a good concept? Sometimes it's there, you know, the, on the first shot that you present for the director, and sometimes you need to go through seven or eight um, versions of the same thing. But do you think that there's a lack also in the education then? You mentioned the education. Do you get enough, uh, you know, information and education on how composers really, uh, you know, get, what their profession is? Yeah. Well, it's been a while since I was at film school, <laughs> but there was there was there was there was none. I mean, and the school was uh, or not not the classic uh, uh, film uh, composer school, but but other the the um the rhythmical conservatory was right next door to the film school and we had no no connection whatsoever and um and i know this is a problem for for many directors as well because how how when they start out how should they communicate with the composer if they've never done it before um so getting on to the buyouts um mm -hmm. Sometimes you, you get a feeling that something just happens. Mm -hmm. Suddenly something is a praxis uh, uh, and something is... But when we talk about buyouts, who pushes for that? Uh, I know that Netflix does it because... It, you know that Netflix does it because they, that's, the way, that's the way they're used to, uh, to dealing or to, to buying content. Also, um, I can, as a producer, I can see, uh, I can see a, a point... Because when I buy the rights for a script, I buy it. I get the rights to use it, and then there's royalty that 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 goes to the um, the writer. But the writer is not allowed to use a character from the script that they've written uh, uh, under what, what being paid by by the production company. They cannot use that in another, you know, for another story at another time. It's I've bought it, <laughs> so to say, or the company has bought it. And I think that's a concern for many productions that all of a sudden uh, a theme song or a theme from a feature film or a TV series will suddenly appear in a commercial. Um, and that's, that's, that's mainly what I think many of us are trying to protect when asking for a buyout. But isn't that a problem then that instead of just, you know, making a deal that actually is tailor-made. Mm -hmm. What do you need? What are the costs? Because if you exactly. need more, there should be another price. And what we see is mm -hmm. often just the fact that we kind of took that kind of practices from the US. We forgot, though, to actually pay people uh, upfront enough. 
we don't have enough for that. It's it's more of adopting to the right. I wouldn't say I wanted to say right grabs, but mm. I, I do respect the fact that that of course you need certain rights. But don't you think that there should be a more in depth discussion and dialogue yes. between producer and and composer, saying so? What do you need? Why and and uh, and how can we put a, a decent price on this? Absolutely. Because I'm sure I have to say that I'm sure that some of the usage that a that a composer would like to do would not mm. be in competition of no. your film. That would no. be something else. Maybe it's a yeah. concert somewhere, and you have. I mean, this is mm. something, and we actually see this also in the gaming industry, where they're yeah. starting to listening a, a bit more. In uh, even though uh, there's a tradition there that is very difficult to reverse. But so do, do you see? Yeah, sorry. Do you, where do you typically meet that that uh, that question? Is it on on TV series or or feature films, or do you know that? On what type Actually, of content? No, and we'll probably get more answers from mm. that. But unfortunately, we do see it from more and more, and it doesn't really have to do with what kind of production, oh. more of which kind of of companies oh, that enter the okay. stage, okay. and some of them also offering a production company saying that i can take care of the of the composers uh, mm -hmm. if, and if you let me do it i it will be much cheaper because uh, i have the contacts i'll make sure of this and we can even get a kickback so sometimes the copyright flow goes back to this company or a production company which was not the intention obviously mm -hmm. because it's draining that so so um, this is not just about you know having a, a, a fair and, and and balanced dialogue but i mm -hmm. think that this is what we're getting at i, I guess mm. um so is there something else you would I, i i want to open up for a few questions i know that that we have a lot of colleagues that would like to yeah to to uh, start asking questions as well but uh, is there something else you would like to transmit to the composers here from um. from from your end Yep. Also, uh, we discussed this briefly when talking to you uh, mm -hmm. earlier today. F for me, it's it's very unclear what a, a composer makes uh, in total for when when doing a product because I don't see, I I, I don't know how much money they make from in Denmark. It's quota, um, and for me, that would be most helpful in in order to know. Uh, a little bit more about how to how to set a fair price, um, but what I do know is that composers are the only ones who who start making money as soon as the. F Now I'm talking mainly about feature films because we used to have standards for that, but but when the film starts making a revenue, and all other creatives they they don't get to see any money before the private equity is be is being um, has been earned. And and therefore, many of the other creatives have often um, uh, wished that they were composers because it's like, okay, as soon as the film gets out, we know that the composer will be making money. But uh, but all other creatives, they will only be making money, you know, when the private equity has been um, has been earned in. But I, I think it's very important what you're saying now as well, uh, in because this is also something that is important not to to have everyone you know as if everyone has the same work under the same conditions because mm. this is also something we mentioned that that as composer i i often need to invest before the film even you know gets anywhere we, both in studio musicians so there are a lot of, of money that we invest without mm. knowing and and when it comes to the copyright flow after what well, mm. that's in my view that's a way of reducing the fee that I get from the beginning because that is actually that's how we estimate it it's we get something that is you know it, it makes it possible for us to do it and then it adds on and if we actually added something to the film that makes the film even more successful we share a bit of of, uh, of the success Yeah. Which is uh, so. If a film doesn't work at all, um, no money for the composer if it, it's not shown anywhere. Um, so, but I, I do understand what exactly. you say. I think that also this proves that it's maybe even more important in in getting us all 
maybe not just the producers and composers, but making a creating a dialogue in this value chain in in learning much more from each other because it's mm. easy sitting there and saying that that I know everything and that's all black and white. Of course, it's never that. It's uh, I think we would have much more to learn from each other in this and and try to open up for for really constructive not only dialogue but working together in getting uh, this more functional for mm. everyone. I think it's very good. So I think we'll open up for for questions mm -hmm. if it's okay, because um, yeah. it's it's nice to have the interaction. So Gudrun, could I ask you to um, see if we have some questions? Otherwise, I would urge you all now to take the opportunity when Leia is here to put forward any comment or questions. So Gudrun. Um, I think at the moment uh, in the chat, there's a lot of discussion, but it seems to be more of a plea towards uh, producers to think more about uh, um, the rights of the composers and that the people are saying that they feel fine about giving up their exclusive rights, but it's, you know, those extra rights to earn future royalties that people want to keep with them themselves. So at the moment, there's not much of a question, but more of yeah, a plea to, to, to start a dialogue with producers mm. and to try to find a more common ground, I think. Mm. And I see that Kate wants uh, the, the floor, right? Okay, please, Kate. Yeah, um, well, I, I was just very puzzled by your example of wanting uh, publishing because you would be worried that the music or a theme for a film would show up in a commercial or something. This just sounds very, very unlikely to me uh, because keeping the publishing has nothing to do with uh, sort of uh, sending out your music and the master to everyone else to, to use. And if I was used, if I was asked to do, to um, if someone could use something I did from a film would certainly make something new in mm. the same same vein so i thought what what did you mean by that have you experienced that yourself no i have not experienced that myself but it's but very if no but if i understand it right uh, you, the the composer owns the music the and can, yeah yeah and can use it in other uh, for other products well, that is, that's down to what's in the contract. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be used for other products. That's very unusual. Uh, I've never had that possibility. So in the contract, you could say you can't use it for other, other mm. products and films, but you still own your publishing, which is, means you earn your royalties mm. when the film is distributed. So that's a totally different thing. So that kind of tells me that... Uh, there's a lack of understanding what publishing is but and the how it's used. What's the difference between the publishing rights and the master rights? And, yes, I think I, I think you're right. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. But also setting the what is the what amount is the royalty and and um... if I can enter here, I think this is um, this is something yeah. I hear quite um, often, and also uh, when we've talked to the industry in. Uh, when we were there, for example, in, in LA also. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and I understand that what you need is exclusivity. You don't need the rights. You don't need to own them. You don't need the revenues from that. You need to make sure that you have the film. No one will stop you from distributing it uh, here and there. Mm -hmm. And you will not hear the same thing in another film a week after. So that's the important part. And I think that this is exactly what we need to do when working together, making sure and showing that there are other ways of doing this mm. by actually making sure in a contract that you have exclusivity in the way that you need and that you pay for that exclusivity. Uh, as we know, if you would have a background track from a, a, a company, maybe not dealing with quality music, but what they say, royalty-free music, Mm. That would be, uh, that's a totally different thing. If, if uh, Then it's not exclusive either. Everyone will have the same thing if they like it. Uh, so this is, um, so I think this is a very good point where, where 
we're pointing at right now, Leah. I, I cannot. I can only say what I, as a producer, mm. <laughs> is usually concerned of, and and that is that is my my film or my TV series. I cannot say what other companies have of of plans of of making a big music library that they want to sell. Uh, sell uh, again. No, no, no. I, no I, I, all I'm saying is that yeah. I, I agree with you, and I yeah. see this. Uh, you're not the only one saying this. And, and once again, I see that the need might not be actually owning rights or being part of that, but it's really owning the right to use your film in, in the way you you feel is, is necessary. So I think mm. that's very good. I think this is exactly the way that maybe we together actually could could get to a point where we see what the needs are and how to address them in a way that is uh, long-term sustainable. That's uh, exactly what it's about. So that's very good. Do we have, um, I, I have one here saying here? that, yeah, so, sorry. Uh, yes, Gudrun. Um, I was, I just have a comment then, then there are more questions for Leah, but I think uh, when you asked Leah, I don't know what the royalty is um, the composer doesn't know what the royalty is either. I mean, that depends on how successful the movie and eventually will be. So um, that is a big question mark for everybody in the beginning. And I, I don't really think that should be an issue, really, because there might be no, no royalties coming in, that, or there might be a lot, but that, that would just, you know, that means that you might be sharing some of the success of the movie with the composer yes but it, it's a percentage of of the income the royalty right uh, uh that depends because that depends on from each and each in uh, each cmo which collects the royalties mm -hmm. in different countries they have diff different contracts uh, with uh, with movie theaters and and with as as, as what um, uh, services and mm -hmm television stations and it's it's uh, cmo has different ter tariffs in that respect so so you can't really say that there is a one certain percentage that you will receive like it's that's very changes uh, it varies a lot but um uh, but i i also wanted to ask you um because there's a very good question here that is how how do you work with uh, music supervisors uh, especially when it comes to budgeting the music. Yeah, I've I've very rarely worked with music supervisors, but yeah. uh, I've I've I haven't done big budget feature films. I've done uh, three kids uh, feature films, mm -hmm. um, but I I would love to, but it's it's often cut in the budget. Yeah, that was what we talked about a little mm -hmm. bit in the beginning. That yeah. I think it's a one one angle of the problem that uh, in the Nordics music supervisors are not really used as much as they could be used no. because they would fa I think facilitate everything yeah. a lot. But I would also say for producers, it it's it uh, or, or production companies, it's very hard making money from from uh, feature films uh, today, as everyone knows. Uh, but also on TV series, it's it's um, it's the Wild West, so to speak, and there's a gold fever, um, meaning that that everybody wants content, but they want it very very cheap, and there's always somebody who's willing to do it cheaper, as well as you feel that you've been asked to to do, uh, to take to to take jobs below what you, what you've um, what the sorry sorry for my English, that you're underpaid. We are, as producers and production companies, we know if we say no to this or if we don't go, you know, 5% down in budget, somebody else will do it. And that's, um, it's, it's really tough, uh, the market right now. Um, I think also, even though we are talking a little bit now about the naked side of, of you know, uh, being a composer for, for a film, I think also a lot of people are really interested to work in this field and uh, and to enter this field because still it's a it's a good field to work. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a question also to you, Leah. How do you get in contact with composers? How do you find composers for your projects? Um, 
for my last projects, uh, many times when you do co-productions, uh, the the composer is uh, is one of the things that you can that you can get from a from your co-production country, uh, because um, the music is is you know crosses crosses borders and it's not non-lingual. Um, so I've done it through my co-producer, and uh, and selected. Uh, selected uh, um, composers listened to their music, and then had had the director had chats with them. Um, Denmark is is a, a small country, um, so there are there are certain composers that you know or know of. Um, then I listen, of course, to the director, um, and try try to guide and advise. Thank you. Um, there maybe we um, there is a question here from Kate also uh, saying if you feel that you don't know enough about how the composers work, do do you contact them and try to find out? Have you tried to start those kind of dialogues we are talking about here? Uh, yes, I would I would say so. <laughs> <laughs> one of one of my very good friends, Nicholas, is here. We've been friends for more than twenty years, so so through him, uh, especially, I know what a what a composer does, and I I know the challenges. Um, yeah. I think it would would be really important if we when we are at film school and when when we are younger, you start you start to learn more about that specific field. Um, be because because composers they do work alone most of the time, and DOPs, editors, uh, well, the, it's the same thing about sound engineers. I don't know, it's, you know, I know that a sound engineer go into a dark room and they stay there for a long time. What are they doing? I mean, uh, do they really need to clean that sound for for so many weeks? Um, so, but that's that's also the lack of knowledge about how how a sound engineer works because it's a, it's a job that they do alone and it's um, it it can't be hard for people outside of that specific field to understand exactly what are what what is the work what is the job. Thank you, Leah. I have to say first of all. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's great having you here. And I also think that this shows um, both ways the need of, of having a bit closer relations, even if you have uh, composer friends, but, mm -hmm. but really going into a constructive, once again, a constructive dialogue in trying to maybe start looking at both the needs and how to, to have alternative contracts that would actually be safe and that would generate the values that that we all want and need mm. so i hope you will um, see this not as a one-off but as a start of a great friendship with the nordic <laughs> film music composers and uh, we will add on of course uh, others of your colleagues as, as well in that because i think Absolutely. we have quite a lot to learn from each other yeah. in this and, and um, also not not i mean uh, also through the directors associations because the directors yeah. are they they are I mean, they are your your employers as well. I would, if if a director. Absolutely, now, I think we need to add a few of the other, the, mm. you know, stakeholders in this. I, I mm. think that that will be the only way of doing it. Otherwise, it's always the one outside the room that gets the blame or not being part of of creating a solution. So mm. I think we all need to be um, around the table in order to do that. So. We're actually reaching not the end of the end, but the end until we actually will be able to have a bit more open breakout rooms for 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 meetings. Uh, and before uh, I leave the floor to Luna, so she can tell you what happens and how in this, I would just like to take the opportunity once again, Leah. Thank you very much for taking your time during your vacation. I'm sure we will uh, see each other more. Uh, and. Um, enjoy the vacation thank you Kate, thank you very much thank you gudrun thank you all uh, having participated in this very interesting presentations and i know that there are so many questions and need of also uh, a dialogue together uh, so let's uh, make sure now don't leave but 
make sure to enter the breakout rooms and continue the, the talks.